what it do youtube it's your boy today we're talking about everything you could possibly need to know about vors so strap in because you're watching episode 8 of toolkit The VOR DME systems as we know them today have their roots in the bombing campaigns of World War II. Early aviators were fiddling with the idea and concepts as early as 1937. The Royal Air Force refined and deployed these ideas in the GH navigation system. And in the years following World War II, the United States implemented the VOR system commercially across the country. And in the 1960s, the VOR system established itself as the primary means of navigation amongst general, commercial, and military aviation. This era saw the implementation of Victor and Jet Airways, which were standardized highways in the sky to navigate across the country. And until the proliferation of commercially available GPS navigation systems in the late 90s and early 2000s, the VOR was the primary means of navigation across the world. So first things first, what the heck is a VOR? VOR stands for Very High Frequency Omnidirectional Range, which as the name implies, is a method of using VHF radio waves in all directions to determine where exactly you are relative to the VOR station. A typical VOR station consists of a circular array of antennas aligned so that they can broadcast in every direction. Speaking of broadcasts, VORs broadcast on a frequency range from 1080 to 117.95 MHz. A VOR falls in a family of navigational aids known as ground-based nav aids. Ground-based nav aids include systems like DME, NDBs, TACANs, VORs, ILSs, and other ground-based installations that use radio waves to help pilots navigate through space. On the map, a plain VOR is indicated by a hexagon symbol. A hexagon with a box around it is VOR with DME. The TACAN is indicated as shown, and a TACAN with black boxes on the tips are known as Vortex. A Vortex is a fancy way of saying you can tune into this nav aid with VOR equipment or TACAN equipment. It is also to be noted that every TACAN or Vortex will provide DME information. On IFR low charts, VORs have communication boxes associated with them. These communication boxes give you a lot of important information. First of all, the VOR's plain English name will be displayed at the top. Below that will be the VOR's frequency. Next, they'll have the three letter identifier. If it's a Vortex, it'll have the TACAN channel and then the three letter identifier in Morse code. Some communication boxes even share the lat long coordinates of the VOR. Some additional details to note is that some VORs will have a T, L, or H in parentheses behind the name. This designates what class the VOR is in. We'll get into that later. Similarly, the Y in parentheses after the TACAN channel indicates that you must place your TACAN in Yankee mode to receive distance information. Additionally, if the VOR frequency is not underlined, that means that the VOR is capable of broadcasting voice when tuned into it. This voice capability allows some receivers to listen to ATIS or radio transmissions while tuned into the VOR frequency receiving range and bearing information. Now here's what that sounds like in practice. Notice how you can not only hear the ATIS being broadcast, but intermittently in Morse code DAG is broadcast to identify the VOR as the Daggett VOR. Obviously, VORs have max ranges. We can't just tune into a radio frequency indefinitely. Think about when you listen to a local radio station and drive too far out in the country. The signal hits an intermediate point where it's still readable, but really faded. When it comes to VORs, the maximum range and altitude at which the signal can be considered reliable is called the service volume. The FAA has broken up VORs of different service volumes into three classes, the terminal, low, and high VORs. This chart denotes the service volume of each of the different VOR classes. 
Note that the terminal VOR is only useful out to 25 nautical miles and up to 12,000 feet. The low VORs are only useful out to 40 nautical miles and up to 18,000 feet. Whereas the high altitude VORs, their service volume varies as a function of your height. You can read about the VORs and tack ends that are relevant to a particular airfield by going to the airport and facility directory, right here. At the bottom, it'll have the radio aids to navigation section. For Tulsa International Airport, we have the Vortec VOR frequency 114.4, tack in channel 91. From the Vortec to the field is a bearing of 264 degrees and the tack in is 4.9 nautical miles from the field. So the azimuth is unusable from radials 248 to 258 beyond 23 nautical miles below 3100 feet and the DME is unusable from radials 248 to 258 beyond 3 nautical, 23 nautical miles below 3100 feet. There's other stuff about the locator outer markers, the ILS, a couple different ILSs, and an ASR. What's important to note about the airport facility directory is that the airport facility directory will let you know whether it's a high, low, or terminal VOR based on the H, L, or T associated with it. And there you go. That is all of the surface level functional general knowledge that you need to know about using VORs. We're gonna have a couple more videos coming out following this to get a little more in depth into how VORs and DME systems work, as well as how to use them practically in your everyday aviation careers. Well, we are unfortunately at that part of the video. Please engage with me if you enjoy my content Leave a comment letting me know what kind of uh, stuff you'd like me to cover in the future. Share this with anybody that you think might need this information and subscribe if you like the work that I've been doing. Once again, I will see you later and until next time.